Hey, so we're continuing to talk through uh, the major stories of the Bible. Last week we talked about Daniel. Next week we're going to talk about Nehemiah. Today, I want to ask you this question. Have you ever felt like you were stuck and you couldn't decide what to do next? Maybe it came right after something horrible happened. Like you prayed, you sought God, you stood for what you believe, and then the next thing that happened was chaos. And you're like, this is not the way the testimonies on the video happen. You know, like I do the right thing and good things happen. Uh, and you kind of get stuck, you know, not knowing what to do. Maybe it's a, it's a bigger thing, like it's a life's calling decision. What, like what am I supposed to do in my life? I, I, I'm in the same circle of life and nothing is changing. And I don't feel like I'm making significant progress. You know, I'm, I'm stuck with my relationships or, you know, maybe you graduated from school and you don't know what to do next. Nothing is, is happening. Well, today's message, we've been going through this series called Help I'm blank. Today it's Help I'm Stuck. And we're looking at the Old Testament story of Esther. A woman who came from nowhere, like... <laughs> It's a really cool story because she came out of poverty. She was an orphan. She was an exile and, and like a, truly a second-class citizen. She becomes this amazing influencer, but she has to go through chaos to even get there. You would think, okay, that's the end of the story. I went through chaos. I held on to God, and, and I got blessed. Actually, that's actually the beginning of the major chapter of her life, and that is what do I do with what's happened in my life? See, a lot of times we think we go through chaos, life normalizes, and we think, Whew, okay, that's behind me. Actually, that was all the setup for what God has next in your life. Everybody say next. Yes. And, and, and instead, you're stuck because staying where you are is comfortable. You know, just do it. You know, I sat where you're sitting. Like, I used to sit in church too. It's pretty comfortable. And now I have to look at you, and I don't know what in the heck you're thinking about me. <laughs> it's very uncomfortable. Some of you that really are my friends, you love me, you might be thinking, he's just off his game today. I don't know if you're thinking that. Some of you that are real skeptical of me might be thinking, he probably takes half the money out of that bucket for himself. <laughs> I know what you think. It's uncomfortable to step out of where you've been into something different, but that's where the fruit is. That's where your calling lies. That's where God's destiny is for all of us when we break out of our comfort zone and do things that feel uncomfortable. And that's what the story of Esther teaches us. So 2,500 years ago, the, 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 the uh, most powerful empire uh, was, right, was seated. It was a Persian empire. It was seated right where Iran is today, and it's, but it stretched from Africa all the way to India. And it was led by this emperor named Xerxes. He was a powerful man, and he was a depraved man. He was a party animal. He once had one banquet that lasted six months. He provided all the beer and everybody came. History tells us hundreds of thousands of people came to the banquet. Probably be the same today. Free beer, everybody jumps on board probably. All right, after he'd been with his cronies, you know, his closest friends, and they were all drunk, one night in the middle of this, you know, never-ending party, he says, I'm going to show you how beautiful my wife is. And he sends for the queen, Queen Vashti, to come and completely disrobe and model naked in front of all of his friends just to show them how beautiful she was. Well, Queen Vashti was not a skank, so she did not do that. And that's a good thing. Can I hear an amen? amen. Thank you for agreeing, man and woman in the room. Okay. So his response was to kick her out of the kingdom. He divorced her and had her uh, just thrown out of the kingdom entirely because she wouldn't do what he wanted her to do. And then he decreed that he would marry another woman. He would marry the most beautiful woman in all of his empire. And so there's this mandatory Miss Persia competition. And all the women that anybody selected and thought were beautiful had to be in this. And that's where we first hear about this little orphan Jewish girl. She's not supposed to be in the picture. She's a Jew. That They're in exile. They're second-class citizens. They're just one step above slavery. But somehow she gets thrown into the mix. And she ends up in the finalist group. She's in a harem with about 100 other women. And there's this guy um, who is, is over that. His name is Hijai. And he gives them all the spa treatment. Like for a year, they are given facial and hair stuff and fingernail stuff and toenail stuff and massages and everything because each of these women will be spending one night with the king. And whoever he selects will be the next queen. 
Now, that's about the grossest story could possibly be told in church. It's awful. I, I really want to tell of the great exploits of this queen, but I have to pause and just realize that there's some horrible stories in the Bible, some awful people in leadership in the Bible. And the Bible, of course, doesn't endorse this, but these, uh, among others, are the example of why the world needs Jesus. Come on. That's the whole reason that whole, you read through the Old Testament and, and people will be like, see there, there's that going on. The Bible's not real. No, that's, ex that's the example of why Jesus, we have 39 books in the Old Testament. They all lead us to our need for a Savior. Amen. That we'll never earn it. We'll never be good enough. We'll never fix ourselves or undo our past. We need a Savior. And I continue to say that Jesus is the world's greatest women's liberator in all of history. And, and you, know, you know, you can go through history and you can see it. You can see how he treated women. There's all kinds. But, you know, you can short circuit that whole argument and just look today everywhere in the world where the gospel of Jesus is held back or prohibited, women are held back in those same places. They can't uh, make their own decisions about how they dress, what they do with their bodies. They can't lead companies. They can't vote in most cases. But everywhere where the gospel of Jesus flourishes, women flourish because Jesus is the world's greatest women's liberator. That's right. So this woman is selected and this poor orphan Jewish woman is selected and he falls in love. The moment the king uh, Xerxes sees her, he says she's the one and a Jewish orphan becomes queen over the most powerful nation in the world. It's an amazing story. It's, uh, there have been movies written about it. That's why there's a book called um, Esther in the Bible. Because it's such a great story. Now, while Esther is there, she finds out. She, Esther really only has one uh, real godly family member, and it's her uncle Mordecai. Mordecai tells her, you can't tell anybody you're a Jew. They'll kill you. They'll kick you out. They'll do something awful. And, and actually, they find out that there's an awful man named Haman. There's several names here. So everybody say Haman. Haman. Haman is this awful person. He is a, he's the first, like the most obvious uh, anti-Jew, anti-Semite that you can imagine. He is a government official and he concocts a plan to eradicate the Jews, to kill every Jew and is able to convince the king who does not know his wife is actually a Jew. He convinces the king to sign off on the genocide of the Jewish people. And so this is where her, her uncle Mordecai says, hey, you were meant for this. There's a reason that you're here. And so this incredibly wise young girl is, is willing to risk her life and saves the nation. She saves all these Jewish people. We won't have time today to read the whole story. I'll take you to a, a few places in Scripture. But the, 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 the obvious point of her story is this. Even when you've been through hell, God has a plan for your life. We have this idea that, that there are these ready-made little perfect families that create little perfect Christians and they do little perfect things for God, but my life's nothing like that, so I'm supposed to just hold on somehow and not go crazy. You know, I didn't curse anyone out this week. Good for me. I did it all through school, to, uh, all through work this week. I, you know, and all I'm supposed to do is just try to somehow survive the craziness of this life. This story exists so that you know that when you've done everything you know to do right and it still goes wrong, You've done all the best that you know how to do and hell breaks loose in your life. Even so, God is still working in your life. He still has a purpose in your life and you're still going to do something great if you will hold on to his purpose for your life. That's why this story is here. So I identify four very obvious things that this woman does to find her calling and purpose. And I want to help you find yours with the same four things. Here's the first thing she does. Recognize the gifts God has given you. These are things that you didn't earn, okay? You had nothing to do with this. Gifts, talents, abilities, things you're able to do, your insights. It includes your parents, who you were raised by, the fact that you were born where you were born, your nationality. None of those, your genetics, okay? None of those things did you earn, and there's nobody in the world like you, okay? The Bible never says the world is going to be fair. But what it does say is that God loves us equally. We are all equal in the love of God, and the purpose of God, and the value God places on us. But in no other way are we equal. You're not equal in your opportunities. You're not equal in the gifts and talents and abilities you were given. You're, you, the, the world's just not equal. You're not equal to that little orphan child that we find in Africa 
uh, raised in you know, rural Uganda that when we meet him, he has only the clothes on his back and probably not even a full set. And if he slept indoors at all, it was in a mud hut, a single room mud hut. And if he eats at all, it was one meal a day. That's, that's the going rate there. Okay, you're not equal to that person in opportunities, right? The Bible never says that the world is going to be fair, but what it does say is that our God is a God of justice, and ultimately, in the end, God will settle the score. That's why I don't have to settle the score. I trust God to be a God of justice. But also, I'm not required to answer for your gifts, and you're not required to answer for my gifts. I don't have to show up with the same energy that Pastor Eli Brooks, our campus pastor of the Madison campus has. This guy is liquid adrenaline, okay? You meet him and within five minutes you're on his team, you're probably doing push-ups, I mean, you're just running in place and you're gonna charge hell for Jesus with a squirt gun. Let's go. <laughs> I can't be that guy, okay? He's a connector, he's a motivator, he gets you all excited. I can't be like that. In fact, when he preaches, I have given him a rule, no caffeine, he can have no caffeinated beverages. He has a spiritual motivation. He needs no outside help, okay? This guy, you know, when, when he preaches, get ready to look and watch because he's excited. I don't have to be that guy. I can't lead like him. I can't motivate like him. I can't excite people like he does. But he can't do what I do either. And I don't have to, I don't have to f uh, understand his gifts. I need to understand the gifts God has given me. And Romans chapter 14 says each of us will give an account to God for our own life our own opportunities. That's why comp uh, uh, comparison is the worst thing you could do. It is never of God and you shouldn't try to compare yourself to other people. Now, let's look at Esther for a minute. She has some, she has some gifts. She also has some pretty significant liabilities. Okay, she's poor. She's impoverished. She's a, an orphan. And she's, you know, in exile. She's a woman. And, and ancient Near Eastern times, women didn't have many rights. And she was not only a woman, but she was a single woman meaning she had even less rights. And she was a firm believer in Jehovah, living in a pagan nation. But she had some things going for her because she was smart and she was capable. She was witty. And she had the charisma that drew people to her. She had God's favor. You'll see it mentioned over and over and over about her. It says, Esther pleased Hejai. That was the guy in charge of gathering all these women together and won his favor. Immediately, he provided her with beauty treatments and special food. He assigned her seven maids selected from the king's palace, uh, and they moved her and her maids to the best place in the harem. Yeah. Esther won the favor of everyone who saw her. That's a gift. That's, that's something unique. She even won the king's favor and approval more than any of the other virgins chosen. So, she set, so he set a royal crown on her head and made her what? Queen. So an orphan girl... An orphan, a little orphan Jewish girl becomes the queen of the most powerful nation on earth. And not, listen, this is important. None of this happens if she's not an orphan, if she doesn't go through the chaos that she's been through. And see, God doesn't just use your gifts. God also uses your limitations to put you in the place to do what you're called to do. I, I just want to say this. Reading this story reminded me of this fact that I think I can, and I can say now, after 23 years of being here, I think I can, I can just admit, I didn't want to be here. I didn't want to come to this town. I didn't want to have this opportunity. Actually, I had somewhere else I wanted to go. I tried to get there. It was, I thought a better opportunity. It's a bigger city. I just had all my, and you know why I'm here? Because I struck out over there. <laughs> They didn't want me over there. I had limitations. Whatever it was, something about me wasn't good enough to be there. And so guess where I landed? In the middle of my destiny. The purpose and the place and an opportunity that was far better than anything I could have concocted for myself. I just wasn't able to see it. And so God gave me some pretty significant disappointing days and, 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 and leaned on my limitations to place me right where my destiny would ultimately be found. Don't give it up because it's not working out your way. You are in partnership with God and it's not a 50-50 proposition, okay? He knows more than you know. He can do more than you can do. Sometimes Sometimes you just need to rest in the knowledge that God's got this. He's got you. He's got the opportunity that you need. You may be running as hard as you can toward this opportunity, and it blows up in your face, and you want to quit. You want to give up. You want to get bitter. 
Those are the people who never find God's plan. Maybe it didn't blow up in your face because they did something wrong. Maybe you blew it up in your own face. Come on, somebody. You ever blown up your own opportunity? It doesn't matter. God is still God. You're still his daughter. You're still his son. He still has a plan for your life. He redirects your steps. Don't give up. He's got something for you. Somebody give him praise for just being that good. He's got something for you. And so write this down. If you're taking notes, God doesn't just use your gifts. He also uses your limitations. When you're limited and you don't get what you want, some people get bitter, they get angry, they want to give up, they want to hate their life. You never find the purpose of God in your life that way. Take, for instance, the story of Job. Has everything. And then within the, sake, uh, the, the, the time of 48 hours, he loses everything. And God's nowhere to be found. For the first 39 chapters of the book of Job, we don't see God. And God shows up in chapter number 40. This book, Esther, is the only book of the Bible. There are 66 books in the Bible. There's only one that doesn't even mention God. It's the book of Esther. You think Esther's up in heaven going, after all the chaos I went through, I, could, I had to be the one book with no God in it? <laughs> dang. Do they say dang in heaven? Probably. How, how'd that happen? You know? But, but it, theologians call this story the hiddenness of God. God is there and he's working. He doesn't do any big, great miracles, but he works through people. And in your life, it may feel like God's not there at all, but he is working through people. And, and you're the most important person that he wants to work through in your own life. So you've got you've to realize, even when Esther's in this terrible place, God shows up in ways that she couldn't see it. And the same was true for Job. Here's the third thing you've got to know, or the second thing you have to know. After you understand the gifts God has given you, identifying your passion is so key to knowing what to do next. Your passion is a clue to what God wants you to do with your life. What is it that <clears throat> stirs up your heart? What is it that makes you angry? Maybe it ticks you off. You, you say, this is terrible. It's, it's some injustice or it's some kind of problem. You know, uh, for Pastor Kip, it's always been the needs of the world. That's why he ended up being a missions pastor and he goes around the world and, and he established orphanages and, and preaches the gospel every, because he said this world is su such great need. If he stands up to preach to American Christians, it's, it's like he's mad at them, all right? You know, let's do something, you know, because that was the, that was the injustice that he saw. It stirs it up in his heart. And see, here, here's, here's when something happens. is when somebody, you realize a problem and you say, somebody ought to do something about that. Nothing great ever happens until somebody goes, somebody ought to do something about that. That's why Moses was raised up and he saw the, the nation of Israel being treated in, like slaves and he said, somebody ought to do something about that. And God said, you're absolutely right and you're the somebody. David shows up on the battlefield and he sees Goliath spewing blasphemy against his God. It's one thing to see the soldiers quaking in their boots, but really more than anything, it was that this guy was allowed to say what he said about God. David had been spending all that time sp talking to God, making up songs that he sung to God. And then he shows up and he believes so much in the army of the living God, he can't believe that they're cowering to this one blasphemous guy and he walks up and says somebody ought to do something about that and so he's the one that does he scoops up five rocks and runs the Bible says he ran out there to meet that Goliath and he, he hit him in the head with a rock and chopped off his head Some, you know what it is it's a sod sat moment I, this is not a real word everybody say it with me there you go you got it somebody ought to do something about that Nothing's going to change in your life until you find your sod sat. <laughs> what is it that makes you go, somebody ought to do something about it? And nobody's doing anything. Over and over and over again. It might be a hint at your destiny. Sod sat moments change the world. Daystar Church exists because of a sod sat moment. I started in a church, and it's a traditional church, and, and I think to myself, this is not going to work. I look around. This is not going to work. 
It's not going to reach the next generation. It's not going to show the love of Jesus. It's judgmental. We're going to all get in here and dress in $300 suits, and the average person can't spend $300 on that. And, you know, it, it creates a gap between the preacher and, and the pew, and nothing about the way I saw it. And we're judgmental, and we're looking down on people, and we're angry at sinners for being sinners. Nothing about traditional church is going to work. And I said, somebody ought to do something about that. And so as a church, we decided to rise up and be different and not fit in. And so we have stories like the video you just saw of somebody who says, you know, I just saw my mother out of addiction for the first time. Hey, somebody did something about that and stories like that are happening. I'm proud of it. I didn't want to be a part of another just religious thing that just met and we came and we told each other how holy we were and we dressed really nice so everybody thinks the world of us and then we go live out the rest of the world for the next six days. That is not what God needs. That's religion and it's the opposite of relationship. Come on, brother. Come on. Things change when you go, somebody ought to do something about that. Daystar Church Uganda began. All those orphans that we house began because we just went on a mission trip. We just went on a mission trip because that's what you're supposed to do as a church. You go on mission trips. Y'all forget that when I started this church, I was 27 years old. I didn't know what I was doing. And this is still my first church. If anybody says, I can't believe your preacher does so-and-so, you go, well, he doesn't know he's in his first church. That's right. That's right. That's why I'm not leaving. I can't give up that excuse. I lean on it. <laughs> we didn't know what we were doing. We just go on a mission trip. But we got over there and we said, man, look at all these people who are starving. Not just physically, but more importantly, spiritually. When you see generational poverty, it is more than something that the United Nations or UNICEF is going to fix. It's a spiritual problem. And so we said we're going to feed the starving right now, but we're going to build the next generation to rely on Jesus Christ and walk in the blessings of his favor. We said somebody ought to do something about that, and that's why there's 1,500 kids who would be homeless right now, but they have a home because you guys... Your church is making that happen. Give God praise for that. Somebody ought to do something about that. There's a guy on our Hartsville campus named Rendell Drummond who was coming out of addiction, coming out of jail. He saw the horror and the hell of trying to put your life back together after you've been through all the things he'd been through. I mean, you got to put, you got to get a job and who wants to hire somebody that's got an addiction and, and, and just come out of jail? You got to get your relationships that your addiction have destroyed and put them back together. You got to find somewhere to live. I mean, all of this stuff. And he, he claws and he scrapes and he finds Jesus. And he, but he says, look at all these other men who, you, they, they don't have a chance. He said, some, he said, somebody, ought to do something about that and he started something called living free and he just started letting men sleep on the couch in his living room and then he built more and more and Daystar became his partner and hundreds of men and families have been put back together because somebody did something about that a little while ago we noticed our church noticed that the American church is putting a lot of pressure on pregnant women who are trying to decide whether or not to keep that pregnancy. Now, they're all making that decision because they're in a tough spot and they don't know what to do. You know, they don't know what, how they'll do it. They want to keep the baby, but they don't know how to keep the baby. And so abortion becomes an opportunity for them, an option. And so they say, oh, I, I don't want to do this, but I don't see a way out. And we said, you know what, somebody ought to do something about that. And so we said, you know what? We're going to start something called the Choose Life Fund. And if you will say yes to choosing life, you won't do it alone. We'll stand with you. Some of, most of the time, they don't have a friend group. They don't have a family to help them. We'll be that family for you. We'll, we, if, if you've chosen life and, and maybe you're a foster parent or you've adopted or, or maybe you're a grandparent who had to take over and, and raise your grandchildren or maybe you're a woman who just had a baby and you don't, you're a single mom, we'll stand with you. We'll help pay the bills. And let me tell you the, 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 the most recent numbers. You guys, we don't have a like a program for this. I just preach about it every now and then and y'all give money. It's great. It works. <laughs> you guys have given $203,584.05 and we've helped 180 families who said, yes, I'm going to keep the baby. I'm not going to have an abortion. Wow. 
Some of those cases we've come after the fact and we've come alongside someone who, are, who are, are, have chosen to adopt or chosen to foster or they're stuck in a situation. But on several occasions, there was a woman who was considering abortion and that baby is alive today resting in that loving mother's arm because she found out she didn't have to do it alone. Amen. We are not here to hate somebody who makes a difficult decision and makes the wrong decision. Everybody here who's never made a wrong decision, get out of here. You're messing us up. We can't understand you. But all of us who've made a difficult decision and gotten it wrong, can we show grace to people who make difficult decisions and sometimes gets it wrong? Amen. Better yet, can we get in front of them and say, I'll help you make the right decision? That's what our church is meant to be. Somebody ought to do something about that. You know what? There's something in your own life, that little T right there. What is the that in your life that somebody ought to do something about? Maybe that's God hinting at what your destiny is or at least what your next move is. It doesn't have to be a $200,000 move. It might be a small thing. It might be walking up to someone in the aisle at the Walmart, you know, because who, who am I to judge the mistakes of other people? And I think about this. This guy, Rendell, who is my friend today, you know what? I, I, didn't, I didn't have the same path as Rendell, right? I was raised, okay, I was raised like the Brady Bunch, man. My mom and dad, uh, like, leave it to Beaver. They were just great people. I had a great, op Rendell didn't have that same opportunity. I, I was never raised around addiction. I never heard my dad raise his voice. I literally, I'm not making that up. Go talk to him. You'll believe me, okay? I, <laughs> He, he's just, a, he's a walking chill pill. I had an opportunity that Rendell didn't have. Rendell doesn't have to be me, and God knows I could never be him. But there is something that only you can do, and you've got to step up and say, okay, God, what are you calling me to do? And chaos may have happened. Everything may have gone sideways. You may try, 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 and, and it blows up in your face. That doesn't mean God is not there. Sometimes that's the new uh, a ground level for what God's wanting to build in your life. Somebody ought to do something about that. You're the somebody that's going to do something. Can I hear an amen? amen. All right, y'all get with me. I'm halfway there. I got to hurry. Number three is this. You set aside time to listen for God's call. Because in our world today, if you want to hear God's call for your life, it's going to be very, very difficult. I would say our world is designed to make sure you don't hear God. It's just uh, every minute is taken up. Every Day is taken up. <clears throat> there is no free time whatsoever. And one of the most important ten commandments of them all, of all the ten, right now, is to keep the Sabbath day. We, we overlook that. We wouldn't even think about that. But the word Sabbath means to cease striving. And that is such a clear representation of what life is like. Our whole life is strife today. Every morning you get up, is so much to do. you got... You know, it feels like you've got 24 hours to get done what should take about 40 hours, right? And you strive and strive and strive to do it. And to hear God's voice, you've got to press pause like you have this morning. You could have done something. You could be working today. You could have made more money. You could have organized that thing that's chaotic in your life today. But you pressed pause on life and you said, I want to spend time with God. Listen to how this unfolded for Esther. Mordecai, remember, that was her godly uncle. He sent word to Esther and said, do not think that because you're in the king's house, you alone of all Jews will escape. See, you need somebody in your life that will tell you the hard things. Okay? Come on. He says, hey, you're not the only one. And if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place, but you and your father's family will perish. He says, he says you know what, God's called you for this moment, but if you miss it, you're the one that's going to lose out because God's got somebody else who will do what you won't do. This is, this is a good friend. He'll tell you the hard truth. And besides, who knows, but that you have come to this position, say this with me, for such a time as this. Most famous line in the book of Esther, one of the most famous lines in all of Scripture, for such a time as this. Mordecai was saying, listen, you're a Jewish orphan who became the queen of the most powerful nation on earth. Do you think that was an accident? God made that happen. And it wasn't just for you. Have you ever looked up and said, how did this happen? How did I get here? Sometimes for the good, like, wow, I don't know how this worked out. And sometimes for the bad. What if you just said, hey, God was in it. Good, bad, ugly, however it got here, God was in it. <clears throat> and you've been placed where you've been placed for such a time as this. Right where you are, right when you got there, right how you arrived, 
right where you are right now, you are where you are for such a time as this. There is something happening right now in your life, in your family, in your circle of influence that you are perfect for. Don't miss your moment. <clears throat> the story goes on, and Esther sent this reply to Mordecai. Go gather all the Jews who are in Susa, that's the capital of the citadel, and fast for me. This is prayer and fasting. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day, I and the maids, the, the, the girls with her, we will fast as you do. And when this is done, I will go to the king. She makes that decision. She says, I'm, I'm not going to live in this comfortable place. She recognizes that moment and she says, I'm going to do what's good. Now, why, why is it such a big deal? Because to, to go before the king without his uh, approval is against the law and punishable by death. He, in other words, he doesn't have to say uh, she's to be killed. She's to be beheaded. He doesn't have to say anything. That's what's going to happen unless he intervenes. That's why she doesn't want to go. And Mordecai says, wait a minute, this thing's never been about you. It's about other people. Sometimes you miss your moment because you're thinking too much about yourself and you're not thinking enough about other people. He says, this thing's about other people. And she finally says, okay, let's stop what we're doing. Let's pray. Let's fast. Let's seek the Lord, and then I'm going to do the most difficult thing. <clears throat> I'm going to take that step of faith. And so that's what she does. And this is the fourth step you have to take. You have to make a faith commitment. I want to point out that she would have never gotten to point four to make a faith commitment if she didn't have a faith community. She had her uncle, Mordecai, a godly man. She had that circle of believers in the city. And she had that circle of friends, and they all prayed and fasted. Sometimes you don't have that circle of friends that are godly in your life. Listen, you might have a group. You might have a circle of friends, but they're not godly friends. That's why you need a small group. That's why this church is a church built on groups, for you to find the kinds of people in your life that you need. And a faith commitment is always the way God moves. When this was done, she says, I will go to the king, even though it's against the law, and if I perish, what'd she say? I perish. She risked her life. God gives her incredible wisdom. She says just what she's supposed to say, just how she's supposed to say. And let me tell you how the story ends. She goes before the king. She convinces him that this is an awful thing. And Haman, the awful Jewish anti-Semite who wants to kill all the Jews, has created a pole in the town square to have her uncle Mordecai impaled on. And the king says, you know that pole we got sharpened up out there? Put Haman on it. And what Satan meant for evil, God uses to bring justice. Listen, the story has a lot of bumps in the road. But in the end, the justice of God prevails. And I want you to believe that that's your story too. It's got a lot of bumps, a lot of ups and downs. But God has a purpose and a plan for you. And his justice is going to prevail in your life if you hold on and don't.